I'm Pat Porter, Extension Entomologist in Lubbock, and with me I have Blaine Reed, uh, Extension Pest Management Agent for Hale, Swisher, and Floyd Counties. Yes, sir. Thank you. And Robert Bowling, Extension Entomologist from Corpus Christi. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, potential severity. Of course, that's uh, going to depend very heavily on when the aphid shows up. And one of the things that uh, we found this year that's been very surprising and very unexpected are, well, is the overwintering populations that were found a couple of weeks ago in, in uh, Hill County and also in McClellan County, as well as Milam County uh, this past Friday. So uh, to give kind of an overview of how the aphid moves, there are two forms of adults, the uh, wingless form and the wing forms. When we see the wing form, those are the ones that will travel from one area to another and they are carried by the wind on weather fronts and they can be carried over very very long distances so that's the primary way that they distribute themselves from one area to another and even even within an area so just keep that in mind when when you're out looking if you see these winged adults that's a good indication that uh, we're going to see some movement in the near future <clears throat> Of course, the uh, earlier the aphid is present, the more likely we're going to have to uh, incorporate multiple insecticide applications to manage this pest. And speaking from experience, I was down the lower Rio Grande Valley about a month ago, and, uh, and I've been looking at overwintering populations all along the Gulf Coast, and what I'm finding is mainly wingless adults and nymphs right now, but we're starting to see some allotoids, which are the fourth instar. Uh, nymphs that have the wings, they'll develop, fully develop those wings in the next uh, larval or next molt as they become adults. Um, and of course this year we're seeing the aphids overwinter much farther north than we have in the past, but we are starting to pick up some allotoids and some winged adults in the lower Rio Grande Valley, so I would expect movement to occur here in the very, very near future. That's uh, something we're going to have to be watching on the high plains for uh, the aphid to move in. We are as confident as we can be from one overwintering uh, trial site in Hill County that they are not overwintering here on, on Johnson grass, so we'll be expecting them to move in. And finding them uh, there in, in Hill County was uh, a bit of a shock to say uh, they might be here a little sooner in the uh, growing season than we had previously thought. And, and Blaine, as I remember the Hale County data, we had uh, 109 days below 32 degrees air temperature, air while, temperature while you had the overwintering study out. But we only had eight hours below 32 degrees at the four inch below the soil level. That's right. So that's something to keep in mind. And we that four, four and a half inch level was the uh, depth that the uh, Johnson grass rhizomes were in that uh, overwintering site. And you looked at that, I think, because some literature says some aphids can overwinter on roots, yes. even if the top of the plant's gone. Yes, absolutely. So uh, the aphid, it was possible they would go below ground and uh, stay nice and toasty with a food source. And I think we might be dealing with, uh, the, when we come up here on the uh, northern territory, um, more of a starvation rather than a uh, outright freeze date. Uh, after our freeze date last November, uh, we were still finding live aphids in the field days after the freeze. So it's probably more of a starvation event. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, I think that uh, they really need a green host to overwinter successfully, and they have a very narrow overwintering host range, and that's uh, the sorghum species. So as far as uh, their overwintering host, it would be any living sorghum species, which could be of grain sorghum or Johnson grass. And most typically where we're finding them down south right now is on Johnson grass. Well, let's talk a little bit about where this aphid started, where, where it was actually discovered uh, in the first year, 2013, on sorghum. And the first real identification was in Beaumont, right there on the upper coastal bend area. Uh, it was found on sorghum. And since that time, since it was first discovered, it was uh, rapidly found not only all, all along the coastal bend area of Texas, but also up in north central Texas, throughout Louisiana, and then we have one county each in Oklahoma and Mississippi. 
and uh, that was in 2013 it was a total of four states and 38 counties so moving forward one year looking at uh, 2014 this is where the aphid was uh, found uh, this past year on sorghum and as you can see it spread as far north as the northern texas high plains into kansas we also found it uh, up into Missouri, it's not shown here, but there was one, several counties in Missouri, but one where it was actually documented. And then as far east as Florida and South Carolina. So what was unique or significant about the discovery in Florida is it can indicate another overwintering source or area where the aphid may survive the winters on, uh, on either volunteer sorghum or on Johnson grass. Yes, absolutely, and uh, finding them, uh, well, let's just say this aphid surprised us at every turn last year. We really didn't expect to see them uh, here in the uh, High Plains area, um, and of course they did, and they uh, were reached significant numbers that, that threatened us very late in the year, typically after most other pest species have been put to bed and we're waiting on the crop to dry down. It was typically when they moved in. We began to pick up uh, populations late August, substantial populations that would be noticeable uh, to just about anyone by, by mid, early to mid-September. Of course, it depends when this aphid's moving into the high plains, but it, if it's moving in late, it's probably not so much a threat directly to grain loss from feeding activity, but we're more worried about uh, the honeydew buildup in those heads as uh, the aphids build their populations. And it sure play havoc with uh, harvest operations. Yes, yes. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some activities that have gone on this year as far as looking for overwintering populations. And this is something we initiated back in late January. And the uh, first aphids that were found overwintering were up in uh, Wilson County near San Antonio. And... Of course, following stuff in Corpus, Corpus Christi was fairly easy because we did have some volunteer sorghum on site, and we could follow those populations through the winter. So we we, we knew they were overwintering successfully uh, in Corpus Christi. But it's a little bit surprised to me that we're finding them up a, as far as Matagorda County in uh, along the coastal bend area, and that's that county shade in green on the upper coastal bend area. And then later it was found in Brazoria County, just a little bit northeast of Matagorda. But the thing that was most surprising was uh, Dr. Alan Knudsen and Marty Youngman, our IPM agent, found the aphid in Hill County and also McLennan County. And uh, just last week, last Friday, it was reported in Milam County too, which is just a little bit southeast of uh, McLennan County. So let's talk about early detection. And right now, if you're in South Texas, it's really important to be out looking for this aphid. We know that the aphid is fairly easy to find on, on Johnson grass and, and ditches. I found a colony of, of aphids on Johnson grass growing next to a building in, uh, in a little town uh, just south of San Antonio last week. So we know that the aphid's going to be just about anywhere Johnson grass is growing down south. So when we talk about early detection, um, just keep in mind we have approximately three-week window from the first winged adults to honeydew is noticeable in the field. So everything starts happening very quickly once this aphid starts to move. So the big thing is just be aware, get out there and start looking now in uh, the southern parts of Texas. We know that in some of the early planted fields, most of the seed is treated with the seed treatment. It's either it's some type of neonicotinoid, and uh, we do get about 35 to 40 days protection from those from those uh, seed treatments. But in a lot of those early planted fields, that those seed treatments will be running out, and we will be seeing aphids start to move into these fields. And of course, the early detection also allows growers and consultants a little bit of time to get ready to expand their scouting efforts. Yeah. On the high plains, we're not going to be able to sit on our heels uh, with this aphid. Early detection is going to be critical for us, even though they uh, are not known to be overwintering. They are getting a much closer start this year, and uh, that that will put them uh, should be earlier in the season this year. So, uh, 
early detection would be absolutely critical and uh, this aphid, the way it can reproduce, we'll show that in a second, but uh, that's the reason for the scout once per week until you see colonies established. You need to start looking at that twice per week then with fairly thorough investigations. Uh, uh, for those who are unfamiliar how to scout, if you're doing what it takes to scout for green bugs or uh, other aphid species in sorghum, you're probably doing it right. Yeah, Blaine, I agree. And it's like we were talking with that that uh, those aphid populations up in Hill County, Man, one good storm coming out of the southeast, blowing up into the panhandle, could move those aphids right into this area. So just just keep keep an eye out for this aphid, uh, especially up in the uh, high plains. It's going to be really important that people get out in the fields a little bit earlier and start scouting because it's possible that this aphid can get an early start up here this year. Um, and it doesn't hurt to check the Johnson grass here. Uh, I've spent some time in the past few weeks checking area Johnson grass, uh, just... Uh, Staying on our toes uh, with that early scouting, and it doesn't take but a few minutes to look a uh, look a patch of Johnson absolutely. grass over. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, as far as sampling for early detection, um, in areas where the aphids are not known to be, we're going to let Blaine talk a little bit about this, and he's going to, as far as uh, where we find these aphids and and uh, our scouting efforts. So, Blaine, I'm going to turn it over to you. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we are looking the leaves over primarily. They're, they're a type of aphid that's going to be known to start down low on the plant. So it's going to take bending over, and, and sometimes you can pull some of those lower leaf collars off, uh, get a look at those, uh, look over top and bottom, but they're typically going to be on the lower uh, parts of the plant. Uh, when we're checking heads later in the year if we still hadn't seen them it is possible to get some that you would shake off in a head in a beet bucket but uh, primarily we're going to be looking at the leaves that's where they're going to want to start and build their colonies up and uh, you know when you're looking uh, for a place for those uh, colonies to start when they blow in riding those wings put your put yourself in their situation uh, the tallest thing around to grab a hold of is probably where they're going to start and that's the the taller than average plants uh, uh, the stuff that's on top of the hillside or near a johnson grass that's been growing for some time yeah the johnson grass is definitely going to be a good spot to to look for those uh, initial uh, rivals and also on the, your tall mutants and we know that Sorghum typically has tall mutants in it. There's, they can't select 100% for those uh, individuals without that trait. So if you see the tall mutants, that's also a good place to look to see if uh, the aphids occurred. Now, once the aphid flies in, it's not unusual to see the winged adults on the upper part of the plant. So that's one of the reasons we say that your initial scouting, look the up, one upper leaf and then the lower leaf. And on, on the lower leaf, Look at the lowest uh, completely green leaf. We know that those aphid or those leaves typically senesce as the season goes on, and we'll start losing those uh, leaves as early in the season, especially those lower leaves. That's just the natural uh, yeah. growth habit of the the Johnson, or the sorghum itself. Um, and the other, there's going to be a couple of things that I've noticed as I've been in the fields looking for these aphids. Probably the first thing you're going to see once the aphid colonizes is the honeydew. honeydew. And it's just shiny a real, spots. yeah, real shiny spots, like Blaine said. Uh, shiny spots on the upper leaf. If you see that, look at the leaf just above it on the underside, and you're probably going to find a few colonies or a few individuals of, uh, of the, the sugarcane aphid or possibly even some other type of aphid. Um, the other thing I found that's really interesting is everywhere I found this aphid, is being tended by ants, and a lot of times, even when I'm looking at the overwintering uh, Johnson or overwintering individuals on Johnson grass, I'll see the ants before I actually see the aphid. So the ants will give it away. Sometimes you can find uh, predators that'll give the aphids away as well. Yeah. yeah. Yes, identification. You will be seeing other aphids in in here as well, especially in the high plains first. Uh, so we'll let uh, uh, our professionals go through this one with you. Well, and, and I think identification is the most important part, especially as you talk to your clientele, because it's like Blaine said, when you look at sorghum, you're going to find several other aphids. And it's been my experience through the winter as we've gone through meetings uh, that the folks that we talk to don't know what the aphid looks like. And if they don't know what the aphid looks like, they have no idea what to look for. So the diagnostic characteristics of this aphid are the four that are listed here. 
Probably the most diagnostic characteristic is the, the dark cornicles or tailpipes, and those are the structures on the back of the body that look like little tailpipes hanging out of the back of a car. If you look at the legs, the feet or the tarsi will be black. The rest of the legs will be similar color to the body. The antennae will be black as they move distally. They may be a little bit lighter colored toward the head, but distally they will be black. And the head will not be dark. It will be the same color as the rest of the body. And there, of course, you know, as you look through these plants, it's like say if you're a novice and you're looking at sorghum, there's going to be a lot of things you'll see yeah. on the plants. And one of the first things as you're walking through a vegetative stage sorghum is you're looking down the whirls and you see all these aphids in the whirls. And people say, well, what the heck is this? Well, it's the corn it, leaf. <laughs> corn leaf aphid, exactly, Blaine. And that's a very blue, dark bluish green aphid, and, and that's one that you'll notice that the head's going to be very dark. The legs will be dark. Uh, the cornicles, for the most part, will be dark, and they'll have a dark area around the base of the cornicles. Uh, that's, it, that's the important part. Right there, around those dark cornicles, the uh, area around it in the body will be dark, dark as well, so that's a yeah. good, good separation there. So... The green bug, uh, he noticed some, uh, we had uh, uh, a few consultants uh, interested on this one. They've been identifying green bugs for years and never noticed those dark tarsi on those feet. Oh, really? <laughs> and uh, they've done it traditionally with the stripe uh, down the back. And uh, that that's one that will set it up. But really, those cornicles you mentioned uh, really separate things out. Uh, Ed Bynum and I did come across a few green bugs that uh, you could barely make out that stripe on some triticale this year. Mm -hmm. And some uh, some wheat too, uh, but uh, the cornicles definitely give it away. I was uh, as I was coming up to Lubbock last night. I stopped in Reynolds County and I found a, a little area that was is a protected area, and there was a bunch of Johnson grass out in that that uh, little protected area. And I went out and I, I looked. I spent about thirty minutes out there looking at the Johnson grass, and I was finding these little aphids, just individual aphids here and there. And I was kind of curious, well, what the heck are these? I knew that, that you know, they they definitely weren't a sugar cane aphid, but I got them in the truck and I started looking at them under a lens and uh, the, I saw the, the, the black feet and that diagnostic dark green stripe and there were a few green bugs on, on that Johnson yeah. grass, but uh, found no sugar cane aphid. But, so those characteristics are very helpful and I think that they, they're, they're very useful for separating out the different species that you'll find on, on sorghum. Yes. And then green bug uh, injects a toxin into the leaf, so often we get a lot of reddening uh, yes. when we have green That's bugs. That's a very good point, Pat. Sugar cane aphid doesn't cause the reddening, although it does cause uh, the color to go out of the leaf, so it's more tan colored. Right. Yes. Perfect. Definitely what you'll see with a, a hand lens up close on these fields uh, are these, these aphids, uh, you know, the we can't really go by body color overly, but uh, from what I've seen, uh, that is a pretty typical color uh, on, on the aphid. Uh, identifying the winged aphids are very, very hard. <laughs> you know, at, in, and I've, it's kind of interesting for you, all you agents out there. When, when I pull up a picture of a colony of sugarcane aphid and there's winged adults in there, I always point to those winged adults and I ask... Are the, is this the same aphid as the rest of the aphids? And the general answer is, I don't know. And so keep in mind that uh, these wing, the winged adults uh, need to, they, you know, they're just as important as anything else in that colony. So uh, we they need to make the sure. They brought the colony there. Yeah, yeah, that's what got the colony there to start with. So uh, we need to make sure our, our clientele understand that there are the wing forms and the wingless forms. The wing forms are going to be a little bit darker than the wingless forms, but if you pull back the uh, if you pull back those wings, you'd see the dark cornicles. You look at this adult in this picture, you'll see the dark feet. Uh, this is one of those exceptions to the rule where the head is just a little bit darker than the wingless forms, but uh, it's all the same aphid. Blaine, do you want? To oh, uh, yeah. These aphids are. They belong to the uh, very weird uh, side uh, sub subfamily in Hemiptera. Uh, they are all females. Every female is born pregnant. They will give birth to uh, exact clones of themselves, such will make our 
resistance management important. Uh, they are born pregnant. They, uh, uh, it, it's quite amazing. I, I really don't know what the reproductive capability of this aphid is, but uh, uh, I know the cotton aphid to live birth every day for their adult life cycle. Uh, so that's absolutely tremendous. Uh, you've got four nymphal instars. Uh, so, Robert, you want to yeah, fill in I, with some more yeah, technical? Uh, and, you know, Blaine is right. Th these are a little bit different as far as most insects that we, we deal with lay eggs. And these are one of, this is one of the few insects that gives birth to live young. Uh, it's very important to understand that this, the adults, the females, live on average about 28 days. Uh, the nymphs can develop in as little as five days. Uh, or, so it, it, everything happens very, very fast with this aphid. You have one that's born, she's born pregnant, in five days she's given birth. Each female can produce anywhere from one to three adults per day, and that can happen for as many as uh, 30 days. Now, we can see a reproduction decline as we move up to those higher temperatures especially in areas where we may not have the canopy. There's going to be a lot of research done on a, a various things. And this is one of the things that we'll be looking at in Corpus Christi this year. We're going to be looking at row spacing to see how the aphid develops on narrow rows versus wide rows. So we'll have 19-inch rows and 38-inch rows. And we're going to be looking at some microclimate uh, evaluations as well as aphid development in those narrow versus wide rows. And also uh, we're going to be doing a little bit of work on photosynthesis and some of those plots to see how that's going to affect uh, uh, plant development through the season as well. Robert, I, I remember you southern people saying there might be a break in the midsummer slowdown in reproduction so it, it kind of scales back before it roars back in the fall. Is that Right, yeah, we've seen that path. That's a good point. We can't, keep for, forgetting to bring that up, but yeah, they're in about... Uh, the second week of July, we just saw those colonies collapse all through the south, the southern part of uh, Texas, and it took about 10 days and they started coming back. But, you know, the interesting thing is uh, that they, they, they disappeared and they came back, but the heat was still with us for a while. And I'm not really sure why that colony suddenly collapsed, but what was interesting is just before they collapsed, we had a big rain. And uh, the rain... I don't know how the rain may have affected the collapse, but immediately following the rain, the aphids were still there. It took about seven, ten days after that rain for the aphids to go away. And so we're still trying to understand how that weather event, if it was that weather event or if it's some other event that affected the populations. But we did, like I say, we did see them collapse. I'm still wondering if uh, we may not have seen that weather event may have uh, prompted a big uh, flight, and so there's still a lot of uncertainty about what caused that particular collapse. Uh, you know, we weren't expecting it. We weren't looking at the populations very closely. They just seemed to go away. So we really don't know what caused that. There's a lot we don't know about this aphid yeah. death. You yeah. know, why they blew up in one field and not another. We Exactly. There was, I was, uh, we did a presentation with some folks up in Claiborne County, which is just to the uh, south of Nueces County, that's Corpus Christi. Claiborne County, you have Claiborne County, Kennedy County, and Cameron County, and of course Cameron County is West Laco. And we know that those farmers spray multiple times for uh, sugarcane aphid down the, the far south, the lower Rio Grande Valley. Kennedy County is mainly, um, it's mainly a, a, a pasture area. And then Ken uh, then there's, you get back up into, um, Claiborne County, and you, that's where we start seeing more production agriculture. But those uh, sorghum producers said they didn't have to spray very often for many fields, in fact, for sugarcane aphids. So I don't know if there's a little buffer in there that protected uh, those folks in Claiborne. Who knows what it was? But I know that about 70% of the farmers in Oasis County sprayed their sorghum for sugarcane aphid, where about 10% of those in Claiborne County sprayed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's the visual of the reproductive uh, capabilities and why we would be, uh, you know, scouting one week and uh, uh, once we find an established colony, we need to start scouting multiple times that week. Uh, just because this aphid can go from, uh, yes, it's here to, oh my goodness, uh, in just a matter of days. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. This, 
Uh, these pictures, you know, we can talk about it all day long, but when you see a picture, it really gives you a good image, mental image, of just how rapidly these populations can 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 grow. So, you know, as little as three weeks, we start with a foundress. That's the female that actually starts the colony. And by three weeks, we've got over 300 individuals uh, just from that one aphid. So, a very nice slide. Okay, let's talk about early infestations, and, and we know that they, they are more problematic for a number of reasons. And of course, uh, the biggest reason is the fact that they're feeding on the plant, and they're removing sap, and as they remove sap, there's damage that's being caused. We have less, less leaf area for uh, photosynthesis, especially if that's occurring uh, earlier in the season before head emergence. That's when we start seeing some issues with uh, general plant decline as those aphids build up very rapidly. Uh, initially, you don't get those visuals, so Dr. Porter was talking just a minute ago about the green bug. It definitely leaves a sign that it's there. It's, it injects a toxin. It causes that reddening. But with this particular aphid, you don't get that same early warning that it's there. So if you're just driving by the fields without inspecting it, uh, you may miss this aphid, or even if you're walking through the field and you're not paying attention to what's going down, on down below, uh, you may miss this aphid. So, like I say, that's the reason for the importance of actually scouting. If you miss the aphid and it builds up on you, you're going to see some problems in a very short period of time. And at that point, it may be too late to actually correct the issue. Um, Go it's ahead. almost like these aphids uh, can build up so rapidly they suck the life out of the plant. Right. And the earlier that happens and build up and get away from if you're not aware of it, uh, it, it can lose. If I, I, we did have some hay grazer type fields that uh, the aphids snuck up on us. We weren't looking as close at those yeah. fields as we were our sorghum, and, and those fields were, were, were desiccated and, and uh, laying on the ground before too long. Now I think Blaine brings up a very important point. You know, we... We've treated this aphid as more like a grain sorghum aphid, but it's very important that it will uh, utilize any sorghum as a host, whether it's Sudan grass or Ford sorghum or hay grazer. They're all in the sorghum family and they're all uh, prone to damage by this, this particular insect. So uh, I think the, the take home message on this particular slide, if you're at threshold, do not hesitate to treat and then as early as possible uh, follow the labels as far as what the REI is or the reentry interval but uh, as early as possible go into that field and evaluate that application uh, the most important thing is we want to try to get rid of every aphid in that field if possible we know just keep in mind that if we leave aphids in that field just think about how rapidly they reproduce once the uh, once the efficacy or the residual properties of that insecticide are over, these aphids can blow back up on you. And we've seen that in a number of instances where we didn't get good control down uh, deep in the canopy, and the aphid just blows back up, and, and we've got other problems. Good uh, photography there of uh, the aphid sucking the life out of the plant uh, pre-boot. Uh, you know, not a whole lot of reddening like you would see with the green bug, but you do see uh, it's just lost so much chlorophyll and xylem and phloem. Uh, it, uh, the, the plant, is, is, it looks to me in layman's terms yeah. like the life has been sucked out of it. Yeah, and, and by this time you're really too late to do a lot to help this field. So, uh, You've got to be ahead of that. Got to be ahead of it. And this is a real nice picture from, uh, from Louisiana by Dr. David Kearns. And it just shows an area of, the, of this particular field that was sprayed by air. And for some reason, the plane had an issue, or the farm, or the pilot just missed the pass. But uh, you can see in this little area, this rectangle in red, uh, those plants are rapidly declining because the aphids were missed, and it can be a big issue. And you can lose an entire crop, and we we know people that have lost entire crops just for missing this aphid. So let's talk a little bit about later infestations or those that are occurring after boot stage or when the, the head is emerging. And we still think that our well plant decline is still an important factor, but it's probably a smaller issue as compared to uh, those occurring earlier in the season. Now the biggest issue that we have once the, the field is headed is the fact that these aphid populations as they build up they produce a lot of uh, honeydew which is basically just a waste product and it's very sticky 
we know that uh, we've had numerous reports of it clogging combines. People have to shut down their harvest operations to clean equipment. That takes time, and uh, it really slows down the progress of the harvest operation. Yeah. I'd heard a story from uh, somewhere south of Lubbock, uh, several hundred miles, where guys were bracing for this and actually pulled a washer, a power washer, on the end of the turn row to uh, wash the combine every few rounds, uh, but they only made about 30 feet. Yeah. Yeah, it could be a mess, Blaine. It's certainly like say if you ever been through one of those issues uh man that's and this is what it looks like it's uh you know what we're looking at here is just an aphid accumulation on on uh on on machinery and we're looking at not just thousands of aphids there's probably close to a million aphids in in these pictures so uh they can be very abundant if they're not Right. And they do like to stay in, well, they have at least stay in that field a lot later after the green bugs, the headworms, everything else has gone to bed. They're up there until the combine pulls in the field Absolutely. or freeze it and even yeah. after. Okay, let's talk about some of the challenges uh, at harvest time or near harvest time. And we talked quite a bit in the previous slide about honeydew and how it builds up and causes some issues with the combines and harvest operations. Uh, some of the work that's been done last year has shown that the honeydew accumulation can be exacerbated by dry conditions. So as we move deeper into the season, when we typically have those dry months where it gets very hot, that's when we start seeing some of these issues. Um, now, there's another thing that goes on with this aphid as it's produced, well, not so much with the aphid, but with the honeydew as it's accumulating on the plants. There is a fungus that grows on the honeydew. It's called a sooty mold, and it actually just grows on the honeydew, not so much on the leaf itself. And not only do we suspect that it's interfering with certain plant functions, such as photosynthesis, but it can also inhibit herbicide and insecticide activity. So for the folks down south that uh, typically use a harvest aid late in the season to help dry those plants down at harvest, if you have a lot of honeydew present, it can affect the activity of those uh, herbicides that we're using as, as harvest aids. And some, David Kearns in Louisiana has recommended that if you have a lot of aphids still in the field, as you approach harvest, you might want to consider throwing some malathion in, say at least seven days before harvest. It's not a great insecticide on sugarcane aphid, but it will knock down the numbers by the time you get around to harvest. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Pat. So, and the reentry is not nearly as much as some of the other products. 